I don't know if you, those of you that follow Facebook, this is not a surprise, you saw that Ryan made his way to Quincy yesterday, Quincy, Illinois. Um, should be just a short drive, it's just across Illinois a little bit, shouldn't take too long. Um, and it, it's a reminder to me of one of my favorite quotes from my favorite authors, Mark Twain, who said, I would never join a club that would admit me as a member. And remember that, because I'm going to kind of do a little variation of that quote here in um, a second. Here's the question we're talking today, one that one of you put in the box. Don't know who, it's not important. You ready? It's a doozy. Why are Christians hypocritical? All right, here's my first answer. You ready? Because they allowed me in the group. That's back to the Mark Twain thing again. Second one. Could someone please explain to me a group that you have found that is not hypocritical? Um, but a third answer is maybe a little better. Hypocrisy is a trait of anybody, any group, any organization that is striving for something. Because if you're striving for something... I don't know anybody that normally just gets something right away. We go to clear the hurdle and we catch ourselves. We, we go to a see, a, a exceed the goal and we find that we don't. It's part of the human condition, but I have more to say. I'm going to read out of the book of Colossians, chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Because I think this is an important um, text at least touches on this. Paul writing to the church in Colossa, and he says this, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, and pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Here's a sad reality of um, our affairs today, and it's actually any time. Hypocrisy is a reality. Look at our organizations. Look at our leaders. I just saw this week... It is at an all-time low. Uh, they did a, a big study in the survey. Our faith in institutions across the board has never been lower. When you look, and one of the biggest reasons, in my opinion, is we have seen mass levels of hypocrisy, especially in the last few years. Saying one thing and doing another. That is something that impacts all of us. It is a reality. Here's a definition of, a hip of a hypocrisy. Claiming to have moral standards or any standard to which one's actions do not conform. Well, that's pretty basic. So let me give you what sometimes is labeled hypocrisy in our world. First one is this. One name for hypocrisy is simply this, a lack of perfection. There is a level... When you are small, maybe we're a little child, and our parents are just, they are just huge to us. We fall down, we skin our knee, and someone scoops us up. When we're hungry, food appears on a plate. When our diaper's messy, someone cleans it up while singing to us. And then they put powder on and everything else. And then as we grow older, there's still these huge people in our world. And about the time, it's amazingly how our moral world and our physical world tend to line up. About the time we start to get about as tall as we can look mom and dad in the eye, we start to see everything that's not, a perf that's not perfection. And we think, ah, hypocrites. We go through that stage of life where we nitpick every shortcoming. 
that we see in mom and dad. Some people are 50 and 60 and have never gotten out of that stage of life. And then often, maybe you get a little later in life, maybe we get wise earlier, we get to be 21, maybe it doesn't happen until we're 28, or maybe it doesn't happen until we get kids of our own, and all of a sudden we stop and think, wow, mom and dad are smarter than I thought they were. Or we think, I don't know what happened to them. Those two people were dumb as a post three years ago. They've really gotten smarter in the last three years. Here's one truth. If you look long enough, deeply enough, intently enough at almost anybody, you will find something with everyone that doesn't quite measure up. But let me just throw in a little caveat here. Accept this one thing. What makes us think that we even have the adequate knowledge to know that someone is hypocritical? You don't know their past. You don't know what they're dealing with. You don't know what their parents were like, what their home was like, what their daily life is like. You don't know. Well, they talk about patience. They're not patient. I don't think they're patient. If you knew the story, you would go, wow, they're remarkably patient. Well, they, they're not diligent. They don't stick to it. If you saw maybe their family and how they were raised, wow, they're remarkably diligent. Sometimes our quick ability to label someone a hypocrite is based on our own shortcomings and our own eagerness to share our shortcomings with the world. Some hypocrisy is simply a failure. Maybe I say, I'm going to lose 10 pounds this summer. Are you going to join me in losing 10 pounds? We're going to do it together. I will lead, we're going to lose 10 pounds, and then you get on the phone, I was here, and I was driving by, and I drove past the Baskin Robbins, and I looked in, pastor is getting two scoops of Rocky Road. Maybe it's just a failure. Might not be even a moral issue, just something, you know, that happens. This happens to everyone. We all have goals towards something, and we fail at times. And by the way, that's kind of the purpose of a goal. When we go to a goal and have an initial failure, you don't drop the goal. You keep going. It's not necessarily a a hypocrisy. But still, let me say something right off the bat. When it comes to hypocrisy, I am guilty. I think we all are guilty. Somebody will see something and be able to point something out. Of that, I am absolutely certain. I will also admit, of all the character traits that drive me the most nuts, or the thing that I hate the worst when I see it out there, is hypocrisy. Which is why the last three, four years have been very difficult for me to navigate. I have successfully not thrown a brick through my television now for the last two and a half years. And it's been a constant temptation every night. Don't need to go into detail, but it's been out there for everyone to see. Is hypocrisy a sin? Are you ready for this great answer? I'm going to thunder from on high. Here you go. Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. In Romans chapter 5, Paul is writing, and Paul has these interesting words to say that I don't think most people ever really interact with or think a lot about. In Romans 5, Paul says, listen, we know that sin is in the world because death is in the world. Um, oh, wrong chapter. 
See, before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not, I'm going to do my own paraphrase, sin is not charged to your account in the absence of the law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. Um, but the gift is not like the trespass. If the many died by the trespass of the one, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Let me just, the first part of that, explain a little bit more. Paul is writing, look, we all know that we live in a kind of a morally compromised world. We know this because look at all the decay and the degradation and the death that goes around it. But it's, it's not charged to your account unless you know it going into it and do it anyway. You have to know. Think about that. Here's the example that everybody in here has seen. It could be with your own kids. It could be if you've watched a nephew or niece or babysat someone. They're about two years old or 18 months old or something. And they're in your house and they pick up some little knickknack. And you thought that everything was picked up and there's one knickknack left. They found the shelf and they picked it up and they go, oh, cool, toss. And then you go up and you say, you put it back, no. No, no, no. And you've seen it, the two-year-old looks at you, and you see the thought. Oh, we'll see about that, won't we? And they pick it up, and they look at you, and they get the smile, and they throw it again. First one, when we do it, we do things by omission. We do things out of carelessness. We do things because we're frail. Paul says, wait a minute, that's not knowingly going against the will of God. That's not charged your account when you know it and do it anyway. That's why I said maybe. There is stuff that we all do, and some of it is blind to us. Um, but sin is when we see it and know it and do nothing about it. Or do it anyway. The hypocrisy that's damaging is what we see and know and do it anyway. The last one's the big problem. When we know we are at odds, when our words and our actions don't meet up, and we go, eh, no big deal. That's just the way I am. Well, that might be just the way you are. But we are called to rise above that from time to time, most of the time. So not only is hypocrisy a problem, hypocrisy, I think, is a, is, I mean, is a reality. It's also a problem. And here's why. I don't know anything that robs us of our effectiveness quicker than hypocrisy. I don't know anything that robs us of our believability more than hypocrisy. Think of how many times in the last two years, how many times someone at the head of an organization, someone at the head of government has said, don't do this, we are telling everybody, don't do this, and then four days later, they did the exact thing. We could be in here all afternoon with example after example after example. It wasn't just once, it was over and over and over and over again. And then they said, we're all in this together. And I threw my brick at the TV again. See, that's a problem in my house. Hypocrisy drives people away. I hate hypocrisy. Think about your coworkers. Think about how something you say might be heard by a co-worker. One of the things that eats away at the effectiveness of a parent is think about how it impacts our kids. There is two kinds of parenting. There's always kind of been two kinds of parenting. The do-as-I-say parenting 
and the do-as-I-do parenting. Between the two, the do-as-I-do is always more effective than the do-as-I-say. Especially when what the parent does and what the parent says are two different things. I think... um, um, I forget who said it, something on the order. Um, um, I, I will know your faith by what you do, or what you do is much louder than what you say. And I think both of those statements are absolutely true. And as Christians, we will be targets. It's always good to have our, our words and our actions match as much as possible. Remembering that all of us are blind to some things. Now, we're not as blind as we were 20 years ago. I'm hopefully not as blind as I was when I was 20 or 25 or 30. So what should we do? In our world where hypocrisy kind of is a thing that people are looking for and that robs us of effectiveness, first thing, I think we should admit that all of us are susceptible. And all of us have probably parts in life where we need to be careful. While we need to admit that we're susceptible, and I think there's a reason this next verse is in Scripture more than once. We need to remember this. Love covers a multitude of sins. Here's what I mean by that. If I'm lecturing someone from on high, you need and you, and that's my approach, they're going to be looking for stuff in my life. If I come alongside people, put my arm around them, and they know that I love them, they're not going to be looking as hard. Plus, when we're actively loving, the charge of hypocrisy is not as readily made. But when we have any high standard, high hurdle, we are inviting close look, a close look at us, our words, our actions, and the things that we do. So be sure your walk matches your words. Make a point of it. Be open to the advice of others. This is hard, but they might have a point. You've heard someone say, what you need to do is you need to find at least one friend, that one person in your life, Who tells you no? You need to find that one person in your life that will challenge you when you're not doing the thing you should be doing. I wholeheartedly agree with that advice. No one said marry that person. I did. We need to be open to the advice of others. It's hard. And listen, they might have a point to make. And you might be better by listening to that. We also need to live in such a way as to always be open to God's voice in our life. Stay sensitive and open. And by the way, let me simply make a statement. It's amazing to me how often God's voice has sounded like the voice of people in my life. Grandparents, parents, spouses, and I've mentioned this before. We get older and we have children. And there's normally something about our kids. There's this one part in our kid's life. It's this one part of their personality that we really don't like. It's that part of their life that they share most closely with us. And it drives us crazy. We would do well to notice that. And use what we see as a way of examining ourselves. Um, 
Hypocrisy is also the inevitable result of one whose faith is a part of their life. Now, I said that in a specific way. There's a lot of people that go to church and say things that we mean on Sunday. And we nod our head and we smile and we wholeheartedly agree. But then we live by a completely different standard every other day in the week. We follow Christ on Sunday, but we follow our friends on Tuesday or culture on Thursday or wherever the group is going on Wednesday. This is probably the biggest problem when we approach hypocrisy in the life of faith. When we come to Christ, He wants all of us every day. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And we live in a world where we love the Lord with all part of our life and part of our heart and part of our soul and part of our strength and we are leaving ourselves in the inevitable fertile ground for hypocrisy to flourish he wants all of us he wants every conversation he wants every day see one of the prime traits of the holy life and a holy walk is a certain sensitivity toward faults and shortcomings and a willingness to ask forgiveness from God and sometimes from others. There's parts of our life, and if we kind of grow a little hard or crusty toward those things, I don't like to hear it, don't talk to me about the things I, I don't really want to do, I, that I don't do right, I don't want to hear about it right now. And pretty soon we kind of build up a little scab over it. And nothing ever gets to it. Instead of having a certain sensitivity. I think the holy walk is not someone that never does anything wrong, but someone who's extraordinarily sensitive on all the times they discover that they've done something maybe a little not healthy, not holy, and not righteous. is having that kind of openness, that kind of softness, that kind of sensitivity. Oh, it's never comfortable when we realize that there's growth that needs to be made. It's never comfortable when a scab gets picked off. It's not comfortable ethically and morally and spiritually when a scab gets picked off. But it's necessary at times to heal. One last thing for this point, not for the sermon. If you're purposefully hiding behind God's name and actively hiding purposeful sin, there is no excuse. And I might warn you of God's words in the commandment when he says, Do not use the name of the Lord your God in vain, for I will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses my name. When we purposely throw up God's name or we purposely hide behind church or purposely hide behind something else to purposely hide this other sin, that is literally using God's name in vain. And we're treading on dangerous ground. So, yes, hypocrisy is there. Sometimes it's a part. But us not being fully, holy committed, wholly given over to Christ, is a means of introducing hypocrisy into our lives. By the way, what if our number one trait of our Christianity is not some moral stance, but people, our number one trait was people knew us to be soft and sensitive toward God and other people? Boy, that would really dampen hypocrisy. In our life. One last thing about hypocrisy. and it, My question is, why, why are sometimes, even those of us who are Christians, why are we looking so hard to find a fault in the life of somebody else? 
Because A, you will find what you're looking for every time. You'll find it. Look, look long enough. Um, let me ask you another question. Now that you've found that person's weakness... Have you looked equally long and hard for that person's strength? Um, Is the thing that bugs you so much a failure, or is it simply something that you may not like? So, see, here's the thing. We're all different. We're all different. Um... There are people, almost everyone, who do not share my way of doing things or my way of looking at things. That may not be a problem. That may actually be a good thing. For instance, I'm part of the crowd at times. I can walk through a room of 20 people crying and not notice that anybody's upset. Especially if I'm focused on a task. I'm in my compartment, and I have to go. I'm, I, what you have, I have to close my task drawer now and open up. There's people crying drawer. Oh, God, I got to shut that drawer. I got to open up this drawer. Oh, there are people crying. There are all kinds of people, and all kinds of people are needed. If you're trying to maybe turn around an organization or you're trying to accomplish something, you want people who kind of get compartmentalized and really pursue something. But you also want someone there who notices the people around. And because one's different than the other doesn't mean that one is hypocritical. It just means they're wired differently than you have to be willing to give other people grace. There are also um, maybe people that push and push and push, and it it might drive us nuts, but then we have to admit that, hey, they're accomplishing some maybe necessary things. There may be people that are awfully relaxed, but if you look, there's normally a group of people having a conversation around them, and that's just as important. Their incompatibility is not really a hypocrisy. Maturity plays a role here. Maturity sees different people with different roles at different times and appreciates them for their differences. I think we get to a point where that gets to be very, very smart. When we can start to look and see the things that make other people different and unique. But I think there's a bigger problem than hypocrisy, and hypocrisy does happen, is that this. Well, bigger problem is um, the person who is always going around looking for hypocrisy. The person with a hypercritical nature is a problem. So they answer the question, have I seen hypocrisy in Christians? Yes. Absolutely. Have I seen hypocrisy at the Kiwanis Club? Yes, absolutely. Have I seen hypocrisy at City Council? Yes, absolutely. Have I seen hypocrisy on the assembly line? Oh, yes, absolutely. Have I seen hypocrisy in congressmen? <laughs> the governor? <laughs> Sorry, I <coughs> almost choked on my own <laughs> something there. Um, yes. Yes, yes. But there's been times in life where I've actually met people whose lives were remarkably free from hypocrisy. Oh, I'm sure there was a little thing. Um, The person that spiritually, morally, I look up to more than anybody else, it's not not a secret, it's my grandmother, who is my grandma McCorder. And I heard her say, have faith, trust in the Lord, time and time and time again. On her not the best days, my grandma could worry a lot. Oh, she's a hypocrite. 
No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I knew that she grew up. I heard stories. I forget how old I was. She was 20 and got, went to her grandparents' house and went inside and was the one who found her grandparents murdered. She was also on the farm, a farmer's wife, in like 1939-40, when the federal government came in and said, by the way, we are condemning your farm. You have so many days to get off your land. And there was some history there that she dealt remarkably well with. I then saw firsthand her youngest daughter, the baby of the family, who with two kids at a certain age, her husband said, I don't want to be married anymore. I'm going away. You're on your own. On the day she died, I did not hear ever her run down her son-in-law to me or my brother, or our mother. And I heard her pray for him a lot. We have to be careful. I have seen hypocrisy in Christians, but I've seen the best as well. And I've seen a lot of the best in a lot of the people all the time. Um, I've seen love when none was deserved. I've seen grace extended when one might expect anger. I've seen sacrificial giving. I've seen committed service. And I've seen absolutely, completely loving care. I got to a point in my life, I want to see the best. I want to see what the Lord is doing. If I'm looking For the weak spot, I will never see either of those two things. When I was young, I could easily dismiss someone when I saw supposed failure. And the reality hit me this week, I'm not young. My son called me up about a week and he said, Dad, can you meet me Friday morning at 6 a.m.? We're going to play a round of golf together. Sure. I'll meet you there. Made arrangements. Friday morning, I stepped in. It was actually like 6.15. And I walked in at 6.15. And I went to the desk. And I said, we have a tea time. Ward, how much do I owe you? And he looked at me and said, how old are you? You qualify for senior rates? (laughs) First time in my life. I was asked if I'm qualifying for senior rates. I got home that evening. Michelle and I were taking a walk. She said, how was your day? And I said, something happened to me for the first time today. And I told her, and she chuckled. (laughs) Used to be I could dismiss someone when I saw a supposed failure. I hope, I hope... But I've learned to extend grace. But I'm also learning that sometimes a supposed flaw might simply be a difference. And God is using them just like He wants to use me. I've met some other people in life who like to give with a flourish. And it's a very emotional kind of giving, which is a fantastic way to give. And I've known some other folks in my life who give and no one knows. No one knows. And if I told you who it was, they'd get mad. Because there's different kinds of people who do things in different kinds of ways. 
And just because someone looks to be a little different or more gruff or more something than you do, doesn't mean that they're not giving. But all in all, what I'm really learning is that my words and deeds need to match. And the, my walk and my talk need to be the same. And the best way to accomplish that The only way to accomplish that is if God has all of me. And not just a part. Not just the Sunday me. Not just the 25% religious me. But all of me.